Uh, calling with fire in. No, no, I'm going to beat you too at this time. Calling oh, with how fire exciting. In. Chicago or kind of you, in the cloud. Are you sure? No, because it's sure? an encore episode, and I have no idea oh. where I actually am at the okay. moment. Uh, someplace between Charleston, South Carolina, Yorktown, Virginia, and Chicago. Calling Chris Anderson in in another hotel room. Somewhere, yeah, I, I really <laughs> don't know where I'm going to be. An undisclosed really location. Hey. Where where yes. are where are you as we record this? Well, as we record this, I'm in Berchtesgaden, and I'm finishing up Band of Brothers, and I'm about to start World War I. So when you see this, I will be somewhere on the Western Front. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I may be traveling the globe, but thanks to the miracle of Facebook and YouTube, uh, we can join you for a cocktail and talk about history today. And today we're going to present an encore episode uh, about uh, George Patton. But I want to say uh, a big thank you to everybody supporting this effort via Patreon, uh, including our top shelf supporters uh, who start with Matt Brogy and end with Bob Woods here. And if your name's not on this list, you can go to patreon.com slash history happy hour and get your name on that list by becoming a top shelf patron. All the cool kids do. Well, and we want to thank everybody, whether they're whatever Absolutely. shelf, we say whatever shelf they're on, uh, uh, who supports us through, uh, through Patreon. Uh, Chris, this week um, we have uh, a show that we did um, I'm, earlier this year, and it was with Kevin Hemel and his first book of his patent series. Uh, so we're going to rebroadcast that show for people today. Uh, and this was uh, the first of a three-volume series uh, in which he talks about Patton up to, I think, July 1944. So that is the subject of the show coming up today. Uh, and, you know, I think hopefully by now we've chatted long enough that, um, that people can, um, people can, are ready for the show. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, lost. I'm lost. Hopefully we've chatted long enough people are ready for the show. So are, are you ready? I bet they are. I bet they are. I bet ready. they're dying to go. Give me a cue. I bet they are, yeah. The bar is open. The bar is open. And our topic, as I mentioned today, Chris, is an obscure uh, World War II general I think most people have probably never heard of named George S. Patton. Who? And, well, yeah. And maybe a few of you have heard of him. Mm. Uh, maybe more than a few. Patton, of course, is one of the most well-known generals in World War II, as well as possibly being the one of the most charismatic and controversial. And he is... Um, uh, the debate still rages. Was he a brilliant combat commander, a dangerous loose cannon, the most overrated general of the war, maybe all three? Uh, we're going to try to find out today. And our fellow uh, Ambrose Torres historian Kevin Hemel has been on the trail of George Patton for several decades, and he has a new book out on the general. I don't know my, where my graphic went, so I'm going to hold it up yeah. because I don't have the graphic here you know, in the computer. But so it's like a it pamphlet. Is, I know. It is Patton's War, an American General's Combat Leadership, and it covers the period from November 1942 when Patton lands troops in North Africa through the fighting in Sicily and up to August 1st, 1944, the moment that the Third Army is officially activated. Kevin Hema, welcome to History Happy hey Hour. Howdy. Your hey. career has now reached its zenith yes. with yes. your appearance on History Happy Hour. I know. After the this, many people find that after coming on their show, their career just goes down. I mean, I'm oh, not sure if it's connected. We hope not. But uh, um, and I, uh, Kevin, are you? Did you bring a cocktail with you today? I did. I'm drinking a mudslide, uh, which I had mentioned that um, there's a restaurant in London called Steak and Company that I liked so much. I went there twice during my last tour. And what made the mudslide special is they would take a chocolate ball, Fever Roger, Look at that. and drop it into the drink. Ooh. Now we wow. Eat. All right. Do you have a little umbrella, too? Look at that. <laughs> no, and very... I don't appreciate that yeah. implication. <laughs> 
It's a very special history happy hour moment. And Chris, uh, I hope you're. I hope you've prepared yourself for this show. Uh, very large gin. <laughs> Ah, just, you moved hope, away from the vodka. All right. I hope it's cut with something. So, uh, <laughs> given the amount of liquid in your glass, uh, Kevin, um, you know, welcome to History Happy Hour. You've been yeah, yeah, dogging, yeah. you've been dogging General Patton for a long time. So, tell us how that got started, uh, and talk talk a little bit about your work specifically with uh, Martin Blumenson, who's sort of the uh, official biographer of Patton. Sure. So. Um... I guess I was actually working down in New Orleans at the time. I was an historian for an archaeology company back then. And I had read about the day Patton met MacArthur in World War I, and it seems kind of, uh, I don't know, blown out of proportion. There seemed to be a lot of different stories about it. So I just decided to do the research and try to find out what was the truth. Um, and in the process, I accessed Patton's papers at the Library of Congress. And while I was doing that, I really stumbled across his photo albums. And I realized I was looking at photographs I'd never seen before because these were actually taken with General Patton's own camera. And they had, you know, full write-ups underneath. And there were, I think, 11 photo albums altogether. And so I sort of knew Martin Blumenson. I had done some research for him. And so I wrote an article up about these photographs and these photo albums. And I took it to Martin. And I called him a few days later. I said, hey, did you learn anything about General Patton that you didn't know before? And he said, yeah, I didn't know that he had that he took photos. And so like right then I knew I was kind of on to something. And with Martin's encouragement, I turned it into a book, which he wrote the introduction for. And then he contacted me a couple months after the book came out. He had a contract to write a, a, like a small 99 page book on Patton for a publisher. And he said he just wasn't totally up for it. So we made the deal that I would write it, he would edit it. And I made him promise, you know, I said, Martin, I'm not qualified to write the conclusion. You're the patent master. I'm the, you know, the Padawan. And so he agreed to write the conclusion. Unfortunately, he passed away halfway through the process. So mm -hmm. I had to finish the book, write the conclusion myself. And it was a great education for me, both in doing the research for the book and then being able to hang out with my mentor and hero, Martin Blumenson. And so after he passed away, I guess uh, it was 2004, Chris, I was with you leading my first tour ever, and that was the 60th anniversary of D-Day, and that's where oh, I met John fun. McManus. Yes, it was. <laughs> what, what wonderful traumatic memories yes. we have for that. We could do a whole show on that if you'd like. Um, uh. I don't think you would. Um, <laughs> but it was there that I met John McManus. And he challenged me to write some kind of magnum opus on Patton, which I thought was a ridiculous idea. I thought Deste and Blumenson had covered it pretty well. But then I started thinking about it. And I thought, well, you know, when I read biographies of generals, you know, I really kind of read quickly through the youth and their education to get to the big war. And so I thought, well, let's why don't I do just Patton during World War Two? And the other problem was with Patton, I've seen other books come out and they all rely on the same sources, you know, um, the Blumenson Patton papers and Deste's book. And I decided to do a deep dive and go through Patton's diaries and letters myself and see what Martin had left out. And I had a new I had a new source of information, which were all these video interviews with veterans that, you know, started coming out because the te technology now exists that didn't exist back in the maybe even the 80s, you know, in the 70s. And so suddenly I had all these firsthand accounts of people meeting Patton. Now, it took hours and hours and hours to go through all of them, but I think it was worth it. And then I think I went through 2,500 memoirs, soldiers' memoirs at the Library of Congress. Very fortunate to live in D.C. and to have the Library of Congress nearby. Is that, and so is that I would the... go every Saturday and go through as many books as I could. So really, there, there you go. There's the, the origin story and, and where I am right now. Mark, yeah, so no, I, 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 I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead, Rick. No, what I had to say is meaningless. No, Rick, nothing, is so you, say, nothing you say is meaningless. We're no, all... I was just, just going to ask, when you were talking about the Library of Congress, did you use the Veterans uh, History Project materials there at all? I did, and I'm still using them today. Uh, the staff <laughs> has been very helpful. Uh, I've also used the Manuscript Room, because, well, that's where Patton's papers are, and other prominent people that wrote about Patton. And then one that really, it really helped with volume one is on the 50th anniversary of D-Day, the U.S. Army uh, launched a survey of World War II vets. 
and sent them out this these lists of questions about their experiences in the war. And I think question like 18 was, did you meet anybody famous? So I spent a day up at Carlisle at the War College going through every division that served under Patton, either with Third Army, Seventh Army, or, or Second Corps, um, and found all of these you know, small encounters. But that's also where I found a unwritten memoir by one of Patton's drivers and staff members. I think his last name was Cohen. And he's the one that revealed the, the whole story about Dick Jensen was, was a lie, was a cover-up. And every, everything I researched into that backed up what this guy said and basically said this whole story that you see in the movie, you know, was bull, was a lie. Well, so what I want to do, Kevin, before we like kind of get down into that is um, just so we can set some parameters here, because um, we talked about this, you know, before the show, uh, we're focusing uh, on Patton in World War II, and we're focusing on a very specific part of Patton's World War II story. So volume one, could you just kind of give us a, a, a brief outline of what we're talking about? What is he involved in? What campaigns, you know, kind of sure. where, where, what are we looking at? Sure. So basically the book starts on November 8th, 1942, when Patton steps ashore uh, on Fadala Beach in Morocco. And this is the beginning of Operation Torch. Uh, there he is going ashore, tipping his hat to the crew of the USS Augusta. He said a cheer went up, you know, as he left for the beach. Um, he's going to go ashore, fight the Vichy French, not the Germans, for the first three days. And if you notice this photograph, there's two photographs very similar, this and the next one. These are the only two photographs of General George S. Patton in World War II wearing two ivory-handled pistols. He doesn't do it after this day. He Now he says in France that he decides to move to one simply because they're too heavy. But it seems like this is the only time he really wears the two ivory-handled pistols. Every photograph after that, he's only wearing one on his hip, and it's usually the forty-five. Um fights the Vichy French for three days. He's then going to go on to take over uh, the Tunisian battlefront where the United States Second Corps is fighting, um, has to rejuvenate the Second Corps after a humiliating defeat at Kazarine Pass. Um, before that campaign is over, he transfers out to plan the invasion of Sicily uh, and then go ahead, goes ahead and leads it, not as a corps commander, but as an army commander with the 7th Army. He's going to lead 7th Army across um, Sicily. Actually, he covers about two-thirds of the, uh, the island. Now, you can see him. He's here in Palermo, and he's talking to Lucian Truscott, who's, looking, who's standing in the street looking up at Patton. You can see the third ID patch on his arm. Um, and it really was Truscott and the infantry that Patton owned the victory to. He tried to say it was a huge armor victory, but it really was not. It was the dog-faced soldier. It was the foot soldier that really won that campaign. Um, and then, of course, because of slapping two soldiers in hospitals, he's basically going to go into exile and become his own worst enemy. He's going to drink too much. He's going to get uh, depressed to the point of paranoia. Dwight D. Eisenhower constantly reassures him he has a further role in the war, but Patton doesn't believe doesn't believe anybody um, until he's finally transferred to England uh, in January of 1944, where he's going to begin training Third Army. There he is, inspiring the troops. And um, the book's going to follow him through his time in England up to what's called the Nutsford Incident, uh, to D-Day, and then we're going to follow him all the way to July 30th, or J July 31st, the day before Third Army becomes active on the continent of Europe. All right. So just a, just a small window of things to talk about. So <laughs> well, it's a, and, and we do want to invite questions from the audience, but we, we, we want to ask to try to keep the questions into the part of the book that we're, we're talking about here and not of, into, you know, what's happening in, uh, in uh, after D-Day and, and after uh, uh, Patton's Third Army is activated. So if you can restrain yourselves and ask questions. Because then you can ask questions when we do that. Um, when we do too will do those questions yeah so i will i will say that um uh, one kind of general question before we get into specifics we chris and i love to keep asking questions say before we get into it yeah, more, before we, never, we get into then about five minutes before the end of the show we get into it we totally get into <laughs> it. um but but Patton's relationship with other generals 
Kevin, mm-hmm. is famously fraught. And and this is happening in North Africa and Sicily. And this includes a General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who he refers to, I always love this, as Divine Destiny uh, in his diary. Uh, Dwight D., D.D., Divine Destiny. Uh, American General Omar Bradley, uh, Lucian Truscott, and of course, our very famous uh, friend, uh, Montgomery, uh, you know, Patton's good buddy, uh, General Montgomery. So look, they're um, not holding hands in that photograph. And, and, yes, people. and he's not kissing, and he's not kissing him. But um, right. uh, and accounts of the war between the generals, so-called, and that was the title of one book, also goes back mm-hmm. decades and decades. Have you been able to find anything in recent research that sheds any new light on this? Yeah, actually, um, a lot of Patton's vitriol. Uh, comes from specific incidents, you know, like we, we, we tend to think of like, oh, he always hated, he was, he was resentful of Eisenhower, he thought Montgomery was overrated, he thought Bradley was weak. Well, there were specific incidents that trigger each of these. Um, real quick with Eisenhower, he really respects Eisenhower early on. And then as he starts to consider Eisenhower sort of a desk-bound general, um, he still says, but I would never want his job. And then that will devolve further to open criticism. So his his opinions of Eisenhower both, I guess you could say, evolve and devolve. Uh, with Bradley, there are specific incidents in Sicily that kind of sour him on Bradley, and Bradley sours on Patton because of those same incidents and knowledge that the word gets out that he's bad-mouthed him. But I think Montgomery is one of the more interesting stories because their rivalry, uh, I think people, a lot of people define World War II by their rivalry, which... It's kind of inaccurate when you get further into the war, but we're going to stick with volume one here. But what, what the, the initial incident that really causes this is during the North African campaign, there's sort of a pause in the combat. And Montgomery says, well, you know what? I'm going to put together a workshop where we can all talk about what went right and what went wrong so we can all learn from our mistakes, which was a very good idea. And he invites, you know, any American generals, and it's only really Patton and Beadle Smith, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, chief of staff, that attend. And at one point, Montgomery's up there giving a lecture, and Montgomery is kind of famous for his rule of no one's allowed to smoke in his headquarters or in his presence. He didn't like smoking. And Patton starts chafing for a cigarette. And he pulls out a cigarette case and pulls out a cigarette. He's kind of like tapping it on the case. And... Beatle Smith sees this and kind of elbows him and says, like, what are you doing? You can't smoke in here. And Patton says, okay, you're right. And so after this conference, there's a break, a lunch break. And Patton goes to have lunch with a General Lease or Lisey from the British Army. And Lee says, you know, hey, what do you think about the fact that you couldn't smoke in there? And Patton says, you know, oh, I might be, you know, old, fat and stupid, but, you know, I'm no fool. I wasn't going to do that. Well, the story gets out and it gets embellished by British officers. And it sort of morphs into this story that Lee asked Patton, what did you think of Montgomery's speech? And Patton basically says, you know, I'm old, fat. And, it, and they added in the word blind uh, and stupid, but I'm, no, but I'm no fool, basically implying that Montgomery's speech or lecture was, you know, pompous and overbearing and irrelevant. And word gets back to Montgomery that Patton has said this. And I think that really cools him on Patton. And so it, it's almost shameful that their their conflict or their inability to get along is really kind of initiated by a misunderstanding. Hmm. So one of the things that I'm curious about is you see with a lot of commanders, I mean, Eisenhower being a perfect example, that his um, command ability, his leadership ability uh, evolves as the campaigns go on. Yep. Um, do you see that with Patton? Or does he arrive in North Africa fully baked and and that's just who he is? Or do you see an evolution in his abilities, style, technique? Sure. No, definitely an evolution. Um, You know, Blumenson, my mentor, said that uh, Torch proved Patton's brilliance. It really did not. He only controlled basically what was around him. Uh, This was a a three-pronged attack, and he had no control whatsoever on the left and right prongs. and you got to realize this, this is a guy who's really technically, he has two weeks of combat experience in World War One. You know, he wasn't there for the whole campaign. He got wounded. Um, and he's basically kind of making it up as he goes along. 
And when he gets to Tunisia, you know, he has these sort of grand views that he's going to fight battles the way they were fought in the Civil War. Uh, and the Germans are just too good. And his army is just not experienced like himself. And so by the time he gets to Sicily, he's technically our most experienced commander. But you're talking about a guy with months of experience compared to, you know, Montgomery and other British commanders who have years of experience. And, you know, but, but it's in Sicily that I think he finally gets comfortable. He gets in sync with his army um, and is able to accomplish more uh, than he would have previously. In the fighting in Sicily, uh, Kevin, uh, Patton famously launched, I'm going to bring up a map here, although, I, you know, we don't have to go into every bloody detail in it, but uh, uh, he famously uh, goes off there to the upper left, which is also sometimes known as the Northwest. Um, yes. Uh, and kind of, it, perhaps perhaps uh, in contravention to orders, uh, uh, heads off, takes Palermo, then follows that by racing across the northern part of Sicily to Messina, which is also where Montgomery's troops are, are headed for. Um, mm -hmm. And his move to Palermo has been criticized as a publicity-seeking joyride, in essence, if I can put it right. that way. So I want to ask two questions. And one is, was it a good move, a bad move? What's your take on it? And two, can you talk a little bit about the amphibious assaults he launched as part of this? Because I've always found them to be quite fascinating that that Patton is using amphibious assaults as kind of a, as you say, to, to kind of go off the map when he's uh, attacking the Germans. Sure. Um, no, I thought I thought Palermo was the right move and the smart move. Um, you know, his army doesn't really have too much of, they, they, there's too much army and not enough job uh, once they sort of break out of the beachhead of Jella. And, um, you know, he, he, before the invasion, Montgomery basically takes him aside and says, listen, I'm going to do whatever I want to once we land. I'm not going to listen to Alexander, our commander. And he's not telling Patton this as a, as a gotcha or anything. He's basically recommending that Patton do the same. And when Patton lands, he is trying to follow the rules. And when he sees Montgomery doing whatever he wants and taking roads away from him and his army, he's like, well, if Montgomery's going to do it, I'm going to do it. Um, now, Omar Bradley is the one that said that Palermo was a real publicity stunt. But it's because he takes Palermo that he is able to launch these amphibious attacks because Palermo is a great port. And with that port, he's going to be able to keep a navy there. He's going to be able to bring in supplies directly to his army instead of having to follow a, you know, a longer chain. And if you've ever been to Sicily, my God, you know, it is just nothing but hills and mountains and rough terrain. And so much easier to sail everything into a port and you know have a shorter distance to cover and it's because of palermo like i said he's going to be able to make these amphibious attacks and that was one of the things i really wanted to research because um you know a lot of people give truscott credit for the idea of the amphibious attacks and people said Patton, but Patton was actually thinking about it as they were approaching palermo so it was already in his head that if he could get there he can pull this off now he tells the navy and the navy commanders he wants enough ships to land an entire regiment, you know, more than, you know, a couple thousand men behind enemy lines. They say no, they're only giving them enough for a battalion, which is about 700 men. And so it weakens the punch um, and mistakes are made that the first one lands in the wrong place um, and it doesn't really catch the Germans. It's too shallow an, an attack, but it really does show that Patton's really, he wants to win with as few casualties as possible however, it, whatever it takes to do it, because the mountainous terrain they were looking at was so heavy in the north, and there really is just basically one coastal road that goes through it that's heavily bridged because of the terrain. So the Germans are just blowing up sections of this road while they slowly retreat. And so instead of playing their game, he's gonna trick them and go behind the lines. And you know the, 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 the second one at Brolo comes so close to success uh, be it for one radio that breaks down that prevents the men up in the, the hills to radio the Navy to blast the, uh, the enemy on the road. And so it's really that those, there's little things happening that are preventing Patton from, from achieving success. But he knows that it will work eventually 
and maybe if not in Sicily on some future battlefield because he's he's basically seasoning all these troops that are doing these amphibious landings to do them in the future and he's learning himself as he goes so when they launched the third amphibious attack both trust Scott and Bradley like this is a terrible idea that, that the ground troops have already passed it I think in Patton's mind he's like no this is good training for the next time we have to do it and you know, and third ID is going to go on and launch a number of amphibious attacks in the future. So I think it really shows that he's thinking big picture, you know, and I'm going to do anything and everything I can in my creative ability to win these campaigns, to win battles, to win the war with more enemy casualties than American. So, Kevin, you, you talk a bit about something called the Patton effect. What's the Patton mm -hmm. effect? The patent effect is really it boils down to one individual having incredible impact, uh, not just in the immediate area, but in a larger place that, you know, the soldiers are going to react. There's going to be a more sense of, of, of I guess, immediacy of, of uh, you know, we've got to get things done because here comes Patton. And a perfect example of that is when he lands in Sicily and walks up the beach and a group of soldiers see him and immediately turn and attack the enemy. And there was a reporter who witnessed this, um, and that's sort of, I think, where the idea of the patent effect comes. But I, I remember even reading a, a report from a, a reporter way in 1945, crossing all the American armies, and he says, Third Army is the only one that has a sense of urgency. And that's what Patton brought to the battlefield, a sense of urgency. The faster we get this done, the faster we get home, the smarter we do this, the faster it ends. And that's really what you see in Sicily because he comes ashore. He's basically placing mortars, you know, with the mortar crews during a German tank attack, a German and Italian tank attack. So um, it's really him rolling up his sleeves on the front line where a general really shouldn't be, but it makes a difference and it, it helps turn the tide. Whoop. Once per show, has Once to happen. Show. There we go. There, there we go. go. The Fo laryngitis kicked in. <sighs> Following up on that, Kevin, <laughs> Patton has a, has a reputation uh, for being a loose cannon, out of control, mercurial, arrogant, and I think most of these are words that appear in the back cover of your book. Uh, yep. And you detail a lot of incidents where he is sort of jumping out of his Jeep to berate soldiers and acting almost like a madman. And at one point you say Patton, uh, Eisenhower writes to him and says, stop, stop acting like a madman with what you're doing. But in my research on the ghost army here, lifting my glass. Uh, um, never heard of it. Yeah, I know. That's join the club. Uh, we're working on that. Um, I found a quote from a deception planner, uh, Colonel Billy Harris. And what he said about... General Patton. He was the greatest team player we ran into over there. He would do anything you asked him to in the interest of the overall picture. Now, I find these two things hard to reconcile. Patton's this crazy madman, but this, here's this staff officer working on deception, and of course Patton's involved in the fortitude deception, who says, oh, mm -hmm. he was the greatest team player we ever worked with. How do we reconcile these two things? Real quick, did he ever meet Patton? Oh yes, I think he did. Okay. Well, you think he did? See, I've 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 encountered that a lot with veterans. They'll they'll praise Patton and say they served under him. I said, did you ever meet him? And they go, no. You know, but you know, we're talking about Patton evolving. You know, he is really, and you see it in my book. He's on a tear all through the book, and it's really the repercussions of the slapping incidents, not single but double, that he starts to reel it in and realize he cannot you know, run roughshod over his own men the way he's been doing. Um, you know, the, 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 his, his treatment of his own soldiers, uh, I think I used the word draconian. I mean, it really goes overboard. And I think a lot of that was his inexperience and anxiety. Um, you know, he's worried about defeat. He's worried about losing to the Germans. If I don't strike them first, Rommel's going to attack me. Um, and he really just unfairly lashes out at his own troops. Now, he calls it discipline, but, you know, he is physically accosting soldiers from day one. Um, you know, he reprimands a guy for not wearing his, you know, his putties, you know, his, his leg wraps, even though the man has an open wound right there. Uh, one of the, the worst examples, I think, 
Uh, for some reason, he really kind of almost had it out for the 1st Infantry Division in North Africa. But, um, you know, he sees a group of a platoon of soldiers marching by, and one of the soldiers is wearing an, a British infantryman's jacket. So Patton, you know, stops his vehicle, berates the soldier. Um, he then makes the soldier take off the jacket and give it to him. And he takes the jacket and he basically slaps the guy in the face with the jacket and then throws it on the ground, has the man, has someone give the man a shovel, makes him bury the jacket, and then turns to his lieutenant and says, I'm going to come back tomorrow. And if everybody isn't dressed, you know, in American uniforms, I'm fining you a financial amount. And when they drove away, even one of his aides said, you know, sir, that was really over the top. And he goes, yeah, but they'll, they'll be straight tomorrow. And, you know, I, I, you know, I think that was wow. a little overboard. A little, uh, another yeah. example, he came up on some second armored uh, tankers in Sicily that are feeding children and has them lined up against a wall and has an aide take down all their names and finds them, I think it was like 20 bucks or something, for aiding and abetting the enemy, for feeding these children. And the tankers are shocked, but right before this happened, uh, as Patton's vehicle is driving up, the tankers were talking to a bunch of army rangers and the rangers saw Patton coming and they knew better. They ducked and hit behind a wall and the tankers are laughing at him like, hey, you cowards. But then the tankers all got fined $20. So those are just some of the examples of his sort of being overboard. Um, I should also mention during this time of isolation, Patton drinks way too much. He, he's drink. He, he's other officers don't want him to visit because he's basically draining their liquor cabinets. He's really his own worst enemy. And I think when he gets to Europe, he has figured out how to fight the enemy. He's confident. He knows how to fight an army. Um, and he knows that his mouth can get him in trouble and his actions can too. And so he tampers a lot of that down. It does still come out here and there. But I think that the patent in Europe is the patent that made all the mistakes in the Mediterranean has sort of graduated to. So, um, I think, you know, as I'm reading your book and I'm, I'm reading about some of the things he's done, uh, the only thing that kind of kept coming up, coming to my mind was chicken shit. Uh, okay. And <laughs> well, no, no, wait, describe, explain chicken shit. Uh, there might well, be just like you, what you were saying, you know, telling some guy in the North African in North Africa. This is Patton's chicken shit, not Kevin's chicken shit. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just to be is, is doing a lot of unnecessary things. Right, right. Yeah. And so, and just so, so, so much of what you read about him in his interactions with soldiers just seems really petty. And, and yeah. I, I understand, you know, we, we're going to light a fire, but, but it's, it's just too much, in my opinion. Sure. Um, without the layers of post-war recollection and the rosy glow of Patton and all that stuff. As somebody who's read through 2,000 interviews with people who served with him or under him, what was the impression of the men then, do you think? Fear. Right. Okay. <laughs> they, they feared him because they knew that he could explode uh, at any minute at the tiniest little thing. So, and that's that's the sense I have, and I'm this I'm not trying to like booby trap you here, but this is something that I thought about, because as we all know, we all have our favorite units, and I was really involved with the Band of Brothers for a long time, and I remember sitting sure. down with Winters one time and asking him about Spears, and he said, "Well, Spears was very effective, but Spears and Sobel both led through fear, so at right. some point, fear doesn't work anymore." <laughs> so, right. so. How do you think Patton's able to like kind of get through this, you know, this kind of, I don't know, how he behaves and acts and because the, the soldiers had to talk about this, right? Sure. Well, so you got to remember, too, um, more in the Mediterranean than in uh, Europe, Europe proper. These are all green troops. Right. And so you're right. Fear only goes so far. Right. And so Patton is using fear initially. Uh, both on the soldiers and himself, because he is afraid of failure, that there's something he's not doing that he's ignoring. And I think it makes him angry at himself and fearful of himself. And that exudes and gets out to the troops. Um, and then by the time you get to Europe, everybody knows his name and they know that he's got a temper and they're all more motivated. But I think 
that's where his experience starts to trump fear because then he does start every time he addresses the troops and he would go around and talk to them individually and he would tell them stories of things that happened in North Africa and Sicily to try to help save men's lives. You know, the, the enemy likes to mine, you know, certain roads and, you know, the enemy loves to counterattack at night. So as he gets more experienced, he's going to use experience instead of fear. And that is a, a great way that he has evolved, which I think a lot of us do. You know, when we start off on something new, we're very worried. We don't know what we're getting ourselves into. And then as we get more experience, we get a little bit more relaxed. We know what the job is and how to do it. And I think Patton's experience in World War II mirrors that almost to a T. Okay. Uh, Kevin, um, uh, we have a bunch of questions from the audience, so I'll, I'll bring up a couple of them. Uh, one of them here from Ted Moon says, would Patton's style work in today's military with today's media scrutiny and Litigiousness. Yeah, he's litigiousness. Really, yeah, I. You know, well, lit, lit, litigiousness. <laughs> right? We like to sue everybody for right. everything. suing everyone. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you know. I've I've read a number of articles about that. Would Patton have been able to get away with the things he has? I've done a lot of work for the military in my life. I've seen commanders with short tempers, um, and I've seen very patient, quiet people that know how to get things done. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it takes all types to run an army, to run anything. I think a lot of his prejudices would get him into a lot more hot water sure. that wouldn't be tolerated today. But you could say that about almost every World War II general, unfortunately. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, th he could, but there'd be much bigger opportunities to trip yourself up and enough rope to hang yourself with uh, when you've got that sort of short temper and those things. But the military loves people that can get a job done. And that's kind of how Patton defined himself. It's a friend of mine said that military is a very outcome oriented organization. Outcome oriented. Yes. Yeah. What have you done for me today? Right. Outcome oriented. Uh, what, uh, Chris, can I ask another question? No, keep going. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So Lynn Kennedy wants to know, and I thought this was interesting, uh, although you may not have an answer to it. Has there ever been a psychological study of Patton that might explain why he did and acted the way he did? Kevin's yes. going, I thought he was leaving for yeah. a moment. <laughs> it's like I've had Lynn, I thought you were driving Kevin away. <laughs> no. So um, this was actually written by a psychologist, Patton's Madness. Um, and uh, I liked it, uh, but he does rely on the patent papers. Um, you know, there were things that, that you know, it, you know, he looked at it as a, as a doctor, as a scientist, and found a lot of, you know, evidence that Patton was a sociopath and things like that. So, yes, there has been a study on that. I'll tell you, the one thing that he brought up in the book, and then I was later, I later found proof of it, um, in World War One, he was wounded and would boast about how he was charging the enemy, you know, but that the, the medical records show that the bullet actually may have come in through it, the back. And so maybe he had his back to the enemy and was retreating. And so I thought, well, you know, we're never really going to know the answer to that. Well, Patton, in two press conferences, actually said that when he got wounded, all the officers that knew him back at, at you know, Army headquarters we're laughing about him getting shot retreating and Pershing said, well, you know, hey, Patton did get shot, but it wouldn't have bothered any of you because you all been sitting on your butt so long. They've been calloused and the bullet would have bounced off. So Patton even made reference to the fact that he was shot from behind and not in the front. All right. But I digress. We went into World yes, War II. Well, we started talking about his head, and then we ended up talking about his ass. So it's a there pretty amazing, go. amazing uh, transition there. Chris, uh, with that, it's over to you. <laughs> so other than, you know, we've talked, we've touched on this, and it's kind of famous, and you're right, it kind of defines the war for a lot of people. Other than the Montgomery Patton thing, what was the impression of other Allied officers to Patton. What did they think of him or what did he think of them? No, what did they think of him and his effectiveness? They thought he was effective. They thought he was crazy. Um, yeah. I was just reading a British officer's memoir, Bigland, I think his name was. And, you know, he, he talked about Patton's brilliance, but he talked about visiting Patton in England before D-Day and Patton's writing up orders for Third Army. And one of them was everyone must be shaved 
before 12 noon. And he said, you know, God, I looked at that and I'm talking to him and I just thought he was kind of unbalanced. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, there's always in these conversations, there's always some kind of word in there that's like it was a little off, you know, the qualifier. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, and, and in fact, I was just thinking about this because uh, I was watching Ted Lasso. But, you know, there's that idea oh, Ted, of... We can bond. We can all yes. bond. We got three, <laughs> maybe six thumbs up on Ted Lasso. We have to, like, the cast will come on the show. Yeah, if you guys haven't seen Ted Lasso, it has nothing to do with World War II, but <laughs> damn it, go see it. Let, let me make the link. Okay, so, yeah, please, um, please, hurry up. Yes, help, help us. So Ted Lasso, before a big match, is worried, and he goes to the boss, and he says, I don't know what we're going to do. Nobody thinks we can beat this team. And she said, well... You know, the, sometimes your your weaknesses can be turned into strengths when you're facing somebody. And he realizes that, you know, his lack of knowledge of soccer can be used as a strength. And, you know, and I see that with Patton, that people, the allies are like, this guy's a little off. He's a little crazy. Well, the Germans start thinking that. And with a crazy person, they're unpredictable. And that's what the Germans start to realize is this guy, Patton, is un we don't know what he's going to do. And that is a strength. So, you know, yeah, yeah, the guy's definitely a little off, but he uses it to his advantage. Ted Lasso. Barbecue sauce. <laughs> Goldfish. <laughs> Darts. <laughs> um, we, could you guys all give us a moment and we'll have our Ted Lasso. We'll be back after a little Ted Lasso bonding. Okay. I got a question for you guys. It's not Ted Lasso. Oh, okay. But you guys are both very knowledgeable World War II historians. Well, okay. What Speak did for you get out of the book that you didn't know before? Well, mm. I, I'm going to jump into that because, uh, you know, Kevin, it actually connects to my next question. So I'm sure. going to turn it around ah. into, into a question. That. But, turn um, that frown <laughs> upside down. It's about the slapping incident. And we've made reference to this, and I imagine most people know about it. But Patton uh, slaps a couple of different soldiers, two different incidents, in two field hospitals, people who are suffering apparently from combat fatigue, he thinks they're cowards, he's trying to motivate them to get back, or he's just going crazy, or he's doing the patent thing. Right. Um, and, and, and you, Kevin, as an author, uh, you know, detail this, you're very straightforward about it, but then very interestingly, you, you kind of call out Dwight Eisenhower. And yes. this is something that I had never seen before. This was a take on this I had never seen before. And you said, mm -hmm. and, uh, I quote, Patton had been slapping, kicking, shaking, throttling soldiers for almost a year, and, one of, and none of his superiors had lifted a finger to stop his actions. And you said, uh, you described this as an incident where Eisenhower did not shine as a commander or leader. So this was kind of a new thought to me, and I would love for you to expand on it, and that'll give Chris a little time to then come up with his answer to your question. Sure. <laughs> uh, this is very much an army thing. When someone in the military screws up, the, one of the, the two questions leaders ask, or commanders ask is, what exactly happened and who was his commander? Because that shows a breakdown of leadership in the army. Uh, there's a lot of accountability in the military because if somebody screws up, why wasn't his leader aware of this? What did? Why didn't his leader do something to prevent this from happening? So nothing happens in isolation in the military. There is that's why they have what's called you know the chain of command uh, that goes all the way to the top. And this is something that even George C. Marshall was critical about Eisenhower early in the war that he was you know too desk bound. He wasn't getting out front. Marshall is continuously writing him, telling him, get out and see the troops, go out and see what's happening. And Eisenhower's like, I'm too busy dealing with so much politics from the British and the French, I can't. And, you know, that's that's not the right answer. And it was it was no secret that Patton was hitting people uh, and slapping them around. Um, you know, soldiers that were going back to the United States wounded in North Africa were telling stories about Patton hitting them. Um, you know, this was not not even an open secret. It, this was Patton doing his thing. And, you know, Eisenhower should have been checking on him. Uh, there's an, an old saying, you know, inspect what you expect. And so Eisenhower was not getting to the front. He was not seeing Patton at his worst. He was only getting reports back that Patton was sending. 
And now to Eisenhower's credit, this is something he does course correct uh, during the campaigns across Europe. But, you know, during tours, he spends the whole time in a cave in Gibraltar, you know, and, and, you know, the whole during the Tunisian front, the first time he goes to the front, he doesn't even get to the front. He sees a guy stuck in the mud and with a motorcycle, you know, he never even makes it to the front lines. And when, when Patton gets to Tunisia, both on a visit and when he takes command, the soldiers all say, you're the only general we've ever seen. You know, the generals were not getting up front and in, inspecting what they expected. And so, yes, that was a criticism of Eisenhower. Uh, to Eisenhower's credit, he did improve it. But that's something that as I was writing it and having worked for the military for so long, I almost felt like I would be doing a disservice if I didn't address chain of command and who Patton's superior was, you know, and how his superior, what his superior wasn't doing that allowed this behavior to continue and then to peak in a, a disgraceful, horrible incident. So, I, well, Kevin, then I agree with you. Um, Eisenhower should have relieved Patton. So there you go. So we've agreed on something. Well, I don't think and it was entirely Eisenhower's decision to make. Right. Well, you know, I didn't see this as much with the slapping incidents as I did with what's called the Nutsford incident, which is where when Patton's in England, right. you know, he gives that speech and Marshall basically writes a letter to Eisenhower and says, you have a choice. You can either, and, and he really, the way he lays it out, it's not a choice. Because you either relieve our most experienced commander, the only one who has fought Rommel, which he hadn't, but everybody thought he had, or you pick a green guy that's well-behaved to lead Third Army. And, you know, it, it's, it's a non-decision when it's put that way. Um, now, in North Africa, it's a different story. You know, Patton, or in Sicily, yes, Patton is the most prominent commander, but the war is still new. Commanders have been dropping like flies, so you know, up to that point. That's why I'm sorry. So, but that's one question I have then. So, you know, in North Africa, um, you know, he had obviously he's fighting and, and he's getting gaining experience, but he's not the patent that we all think of later. Why do you think they keep him around? Hmm, I mean, that's a very good question because because uh, Eisenhower does have that option, and I think it's because his name was already a bit iconic. You're looking at a guy who had made the front page of Life magazine during the Tennessee or the Louisiana maneuvers of 1941. Um, he's been in the newspapers for a long time because of his exploits during the, the Mexican incursion uh, for being the first tank commander of World War One, you know, protege of John J. Pershing. And so he is a bit iconic. He's very well connected in the army. He knows Marshall, you know, he gets Pershing's blessing in a hospital before he leaves. And so, and Eisenhower knew Patton. They, they had been kind of buddies right after World War I, where they were developing tank ideas. I really shouldn't even say, you know, doctrine or anything. Um, and so I think he was like, I think this guy can do it. He screwed up, but I'm going to give him another chance. It really boils down to Eisenhower. And I think the fact that he knew Patton and believe that he could, in the right circumstances, you know, achieve what he needed to, to have been, a, to, what he needed done in order to win the war. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did, Twice. I, did I say something Twice. wrong there? No. no. Twice. Twice. Oh, he's still on mute. Rick, you need to get your head. All right, all right. <laughs> Jesus, that's twice, twice in this show. Twice in the show. What I'm trying to uh, keep, to keep. You probably keep... interrupted with brilliant things like five times uh, when I was talking, Rick. <laughs> I I never would interrupt you while you were talking, Kevin. That's it's only after you're talking that I try to, to speak. But I mute myself in order to make sure that my heavy sighs during your remarks are not heard. Ah. Uh, no, that's actually why I mute Chris. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mute myself for the same reason. I don't want my breathing or my burping from the beer to uh, interfere with the brilliant thoughts you're expressing about General George Patton. Um, I, uh, Patton is denied a role in D-Day. Uh, and, and maybe that's because of the slapping incident, uh, at least indirectly or maybe directly. Um, you speculate a little bit in the book about what might have been different about D-Day if Patton had been involved say, mm -hmm. as the American commander, or which was a role played by Omar Bradley, his one-time subordinate, 
or a commander of one of the beaches, Omaha or Utah? Speculate a little bit for us. Sure. Um, so with Omaha Beach, um, I patent, you know, he deliberately said after the battle, everybody has 2020 vision after the battle, that he would have not uh, loaded down all the soldiers with so much equipment. Uh, it had been his experience. And remember, he is the most experienced amphibious commander by the time of D-Day. Um, and so some of this is, you know, me plucking quotes and the other is honest, just speculation by me. But he did say the troops were too weighed down with equipment, in some cases, 75 to 100 pounds of equipment for an amphibious assault. So you got to add all the weight of the water on these uniforms and their equipment getting waterlogged. Um, I believe, I don't have proof of this, but I mentioned the radio going out uh, during one of the amphibious attacks in Sicily and communications from ship to shore were very poor on D-Day. I believe he would have doubled up the amount of ground radio men going ashore on D-Day to, you know, buttress or, or reinforce that communication uh, from ship to shore. Um, at Point to Hawk, uh, there was that signal. Uh, so Point to Hawk is a cliff in between Omaha and Utah beaches. And the Rangers assault a, a cliff in order to take out the guns. And there's a standing order of basically of, you know, if... If they need more troops, they're going to send a signal. And if they don't, we'll take those rangers and send them into Omaha Beach. I think Patton would have eliminated the idea of the signal. Uh, he knew how tenuous beach landings are. He knew how bad communications were. I think he would have said, send everybody up at once. You know, uh, don't don't give yourself an opportunity to be weak. That's what happened to us at Jella Beach. It did not go well. No, everybody go in at Point to Hawk. Um, skip down to Utah Beach. Um, St. Mary Glees is sort of the goal for Utah Beach. This is the town that the paratroopers are going to jump on. It's the first city or town liberated on D-Day. And to ensure, or I guess to ensure success, um, the Allied planners said, you know, what's probably going to happen is the Germans are going to launch an armor attack to get St. Mary Glees back. It's that important. So what they did is they took an airborne commander a uh, guy named Edson, put him in charge of a task force. They took an independent tank battalion and put glider men on top of the tanks, landed them at 12 noon. Their job was to race for St. Mariglise, um, and the attack fails. It gets bogged down just short of the town. Uh, the Germans, you know, have enough of a defense to stop it. I think Patton would have looked at that amalgamation of a task force and said, no way and would have taken a battalion out of either 2nd Armored or uh, even 4th Armored Division, maybe even 3rd Armored, and sent them in because then you would have had armored infantrymen trained on how to work with armor instead of glider men that really were not trained in that matter. Uh, they would have been under command of an armor commander who understood what armor could do and the speed of it instead of a light infantryman, which is really what a paratroop commander is. Um, and I think that would have been a big difference. The one thing I think Patton would have decided on that would have been a mistake is he did not believe in airborne divisions. He thought they took right. too much time to plan and organize and drop. He said what we really should have is just regiments, independent regiments that, you know, army commanders can use quickly. But I think for something like D-Day, you needed the strength of an entire division going in. So I think he might have weakened his hand by using only a couple of regiments instead of two entire divisions. So, Kevin, given how much time you've spent with this individual, and I know you've spent quite a bit. Yeah. So did you learn anything new in this latest effort, latest biography? I mean, did you like, wow, oh, yeah. shit, I never. So what are, yeah. some of the, what are some of the takeaways that, you know, or the surprises that you. I was going to say, that was my question for you guys. Well, so the, the two to... biggie, the two big ones um, were um, A, Patton's. Uh, the death of Dick Jensen, that in the movie and in Patton's letters and diary and Omar Bradley's memoir, there he is, uh, they talk about how a, you know, that Dick Jensen had gone off with this special armored force and was killed during it. And, you know, in the movie, they depicted that he's going off to see Bradley on the front lines when he's killed. And, you know, when I came across this unpublished memoir by one of Patton's uh, staffers, that said, no, that was a cover story. What really happened is on April 1st, 1943, 
patent against Eisenhower's orders because Eisenhower told him specifically and put it in writing not to go up front. He wanted a corps commander, not a casualty. Well, Patton, in defiance of that order, moves his headquarters about four miles closer to enemy lines after the Battle of uh, El Guitar. And it's there that uh, he starts setting up camp and he sends this guy Cohen up a hill because some artillery rounds come in and he thinks the Germans, you know, can see this. So he wants Cohen to go to the top of the hill, look down, see if there's any Germans. Well, the Germans start shelling the area and he's screaming at Cohen, you know, get back here. You blew our position. You know, you let the Germans know where we are. And Cohen comes back and says, no, sir, I got halfway up that hill. The Germans are on top of that hill. They see everything we're doing. And Patton says, you know, bull. Um, and then within 20 minutes, German fighters are flying over, dive bombing everything. And that's how Dick Jensen is killed. And Patton was about 10 feet away from him when it happened. Um, he's so shook up that Bradley has to kind of help put Patton in the vehicle. And, you know, I was looking like, okay, is this story true or not? And in my research, the oddest place I found it was in my first book, Patton's Photographs. Because Patton never said he went to the area where Dick Jensen was killed. He only went to visit his grave. But in his photo albums is this photo. Now, that's Al Stiller, one of Patton's uh, staff members. The hole in front of him is the slit trench where, where uh, Dick Jensen was killed. Where Stiller is standing is the shell hole of the bomb that killed him. And that photograph was taken with Patton's camera. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is this really happened. It was right here. I found other eyewitnesses that co collaborated, corroborate, corroborated with. I got to cut down on the drinking here. We have um, to mute you if you keep going. <laughs> and another thing, I never will do that. Um, We're going to do drunk history on History Happy Hour. No. <laughs> it's a weekly occurrence. So, um, no, so it, it, so that's a biggie. You know, that that really rewrites the script of what happened because it changes the relationship i think between Patton and bradley because bradley is part of this cover-up and um i think he was resentful that he had to do this now chris if anything there's your incident when eisenhower should have sent Patton home that was open defiance of his orders i don't care how brilliant you are if you're not following your commander's orders sorry you're out of a job yep. uh so that's the that's number one and then number two is the relief of Terry Allen and, and Teddy Roosevelt mm. that Omar Bradley says in his memoir that he was responsible for, and a lot of historians have followed suit. But in Patton's, uh, I guess it was his diaries, on the back page of one, Hap Gay, his uh, chief of staff, wrote in his own handwriting that, you know, no, Bradley didn't relieve, he was never relieved of command. That Marshall, George C. Marshall back in the States, said, we were so humiliated by the Kazarine Pass, you need to start rotating some of our best commanders back to the States to train these armies. And I thought that was interesting. Um, and I realized it, change, it changes the narrative, but is, is he alone talking about this? Well, you know, the army wrote a whole history of World War II we call the Green Books. And the notes for those Green Books are in the National Archives. So I actually pulled some of the Green Book notes, and it was a great relief to find out some of my great mentors and heroes were just as bad at grammar and spelling as I am <laughs> in my first draft. But um, there was a, the two generals were interviewed that both said, hey, all this garbage about Terry Allen being relieved because he was some kind of maverick general is bull. This was a re rotation home that Patton complained about. It was supposed to happen at the end of North Africa. But Patton said, no, I need Terry Allen for Sicily. I need his experience. I need that experienced division. And the compromise was, okay, once Sicily is secure, then we'll rotate him out. And so, and, and then the, the other general said, I completely agree with what he just said. He's telling you the truth. The idea was to send Terry Allen back, put him in charge of a training of an entire corps, and then bring it to Europe. Now, Terry Allen never did train a corps. He comes back with a division. It's my opinion, and anybody can trash me on this, but in everything I've read about Terry Allen, uh, I think he had a very bad drinking problem when he got back to the States. I think he was suffering a lot of post-traumatic stress uh, from the two campaigns, and I think it got the better of him, so they kept him at division command and did not promote him to corps command. But that was something that really rewrote 
the history for me. And I, I've talked about this with other historians that I've seen a pattern. I don't know if you guys agree with this or not, but you know, after the American Revolution, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, the first histories that come out are written by the players, and they all want to make themselves look good. Right. And then the second uh, uh, iteration comes out from people that know those leaders or their parents were in the wars and stuff like that. And so they tend to write more glowing, more positive reports. And then it's that third wave of historians that have gone back and dug through the unclassified materials and, you know, get those interviews like I've been getting that tell a clearer picture of, no, 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 here's what really happened. And I think we're just reaching that with World War II. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting uh, notion to end on, Kevin, because we're we're just about running out of time. And I, I didn't would, conclude. <laughs> and I would I I would add to that uh, that that a lot of times what's and you've talked about this too, and it's come out in what you've said. A lot of times, what's in the early histories can be repeated by a lot of people who are not doing uh, their own research or doing enough research, and so mm -hmm. it can get kind of baked into the historical record, whether they're true or not. But Kevin Hemel, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm going to hold it up in front of my face. Kevin's book here, and I'll put myself full screen so you can see uh -huh. it, is Patton's yep. War. When What's does your... Volume 2 come out, Kevin? Uh, it's due to the publisher on April 1st. I can't right. control it beyond that. Well, and there I'm going go. to make sure that we, we talk before that. I'm not sure three references to the Ghost Army is enough. Oh, look at and, that. And uh, hey. I want to make sure that... Uh, that you are that you're properly dealing with it there. But Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, and we're back, Wait. Chris, and we're back semi live on tape. Somewhere we're again in the cloud someplace. But we're going to be really live next week, drinking. Thank you. Thank taking God, comments Chris. from people. Um, you know, calling out our viewers. And what are we going to be talking about next week? Well, we're going to actually, you know, we're getting back to something that we've been talking about for a while, we're a book called Fugitives, uh, which is um, sort of what happens to all of these former Nazis after they uh, have to find new work. What happens when you quit your day job and you're a fascist, right? Yeah, and uh, and it turns out that, that some of them get into bed with the old U.S. of A. Or we get into bed with them, I'm not sure. Shocking. How that works, but that's a fascinating story. We kind of touched on it a few weeks ago in an interview we did, but we're going to be able to dive into a lot more depth about that. And it's a pretty icky tale, I just have yeah. to say. <laughs> maybe my, maybe my well, skin, we are looking forward to it. Maybe it's getting caught a little bit, but please come and check it out. Uh, uh, yes. And um, I want to thank Cheryl Del Pozo for booking uh, Danny Orbach, our guest next week, and all the yep. other stuff she does. And I want to thank you all for being with us. Keep living and learning. Be safe, everyone. Thanks. And we'll 